Hey folks, Paul Abernathy here. On today's lesson, we're gonna talk a little bit about available fault current, what you need to know as an electrician, and SCCR ratings of a piece of equipment, let's say panel board, uh, when we're talking about the service equipment, and what AIC rating is, maybe is the main breaker, how that all works together, and what you need to know as an electrician uh, if you're installing a piece of equipment other than a dwelling application. So let's say commercial building, or maybe in a uh, retail uh, uh, complex or whatnot, and you're doing something and you need to know what the available fault current is and whether the equipment I'm working with at the service level is adequate to handle this available fault current. So we're gonna be looking at that today really briefly and kind of give you an understanding. Now again, all of this is covered in our Fast Tracks program in extreme detail with illustrations and call outs to kind of give you that understanding of things like 110.10 and 110.9, uh, which answers questions about SCCR and AIC ratings or interruptive current ratings, all those type of things, uh, as well as labeling requirements and, and all that. So we're gonna get a brief look at it here and maybe kind of clear some things up for you. All right, so in our program, we're looking at, we're in unit 14. Uh, and this is 14-2E. Now, unit 14 in our Fast Tracks program is dealing with other than dwelling. So more like commercial applications is what we're dealing with in this unit, okay? So our focus is short circuit current ratings and again, available fault current. All right, here we got our great call outs again as we always have in our Fast Tracks program. You see A, B, C, D, E, and you come down here, you'll see a piece of equipment, and of course, everything is called out. Uh, so that you get a better understanding of what we're talking about. Like this SCCR is, again, the equipment itself. Available fault current is labeled on here. Again, it's labeled for the environment to where it's going to be. So it's like a phenolic label. It can't be like an inkjet. It's got to be able to withstand the environment that it's exposed to. Uh, you got your 110.16, your arc flash hazard labels, and everything else here as well. Okay, so we'll kind of get back to this and kind of go through the numbers. All right, let's look at A first. It says service equipment other than dwelling units, so we are definitely not talking about dwelling units here, shall be legibly marked in the field with a maximum available fault current. Now, the field markings shall include the date of whoever did the fault current calculation, whether this was provided to you by the utility, the once you got it, once you install it, uh, this is the date that you're gonna put on the piece of equipment, what that available fault current is, okay? Uh, and of course, that marking, that label, has to be of sufficient durability to withstand the environment. Again, let's 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 use common sense here. Other than what the code tells us, use a little common sense. If, if we're gonna install this outside, then we need to make sure this label is going to last the exposure. And because it's the people that are coming in later who might be adding some stuff, changing some stuff, uh, and need to make sure that the equipment that they're putting in there is equal to or greater than the potential available fault current that we're dealing with, okay? Uh, it goes on to say, the calculation shall be documented and made available to authorized, uh, to those authorized to design, install, inspect, maintain, or operate the system. All this is in 110.14.24a. And again, as you always know from me, when you see these chevrons, we're gonna go look at the code. One of the more important ones here is inspect. So inspectors have every right to demand you show them the available fault current at that service location. And they wanna make sure that the equipment that's being installed can handle it. So that's what they're gonna use that. Uh, and they're gonna see that it's dated. So it's a relevant calculation, whether it's again provided to you by the utility or you did the calculation. Um, but it needs to be data needs to be there. And if the inspector wants to see it, it needs to be available for them to see that. All right, so now we're going to look at 110.24a real quick. So here's where we're at in 110.24a. And you see it's titled Available Fault Current. And here is your field markings, which you're required to do. And again, we're talking service equipment in this situation. And again, we're not talking about dwelling units. Okay, so everything other than a dwelling unit. And it says that it shall be legibly marked in the field with the available fault current. The field markings shall include the date, we talked about that, that the fault current calculation was performed and provided, put on the equipment, and be of sufficient durability, that is the label, to withstand the environment to which it's exposed to. Okay? So all of this is verbatim what we just read to you in the lesson. 
Uh, interesting thing is there are some informational notes down here. Again, this is talking about 70E. Uh, again, kind of goes through some some things about personal protective equipment and things like that that you have to be very aware of when you're working around electrical equipment. Um, but one of the informational notes right here, number two, says the values for the available fault current uh, for use in determining appropriate minimum short circuit current ratings and the interruptive ratings, let's say, on the overcurrent device uh, for the service are available from the utility in published or other forms. So the utility can provide you this information. And that's where I would really push back. I would make sure that the utilities can give you this information and they know what their transformers are. They know what the impedance of these transformers are. Again, they know if it's a service lateral or service drop, the distance, because you gotta remember, the available fault current will drop when you have more impedance in the conductors or it goes further into the building. So they'll know what it is to the service equipment. Uh, if you're trying to do this calculation yourself, there's a Cooper Busman uh, application you can use. But again, you gotta make sure you, you hit all those points and maybe in a future video, we'll talk about how to use that software properly. But I think you need to lean on your utilities to give you this value. Now, one other important thing that we wanna look at since we're right here anyway, and it's probably gonna come up, is the information about modification. So when you originally do this and you mark everything and you're sizing your equipment, make, making sure that your short circuit current rating and your breakers interruptive rating values, amp interruptive can actually meet or exceed the available fault current, okay? We're not talking about the rating of the breaker as far as like a 200 amps or 150 or whatever. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the AIC rating that's stamped on the breaker itself, okay? Typically 22,000, uh, 25,000, maybe 30,000, 32, depending on what you're working with, right? That's totally different than the amp rating of the breaker itself. Let's make sure that's all clear. Um, so if there's a modification, now let me give you an example where you might run into a modification. Uh, one time I did a, a shopping center complex and there was a future expansion next to it, but they were working on one side and they had transformers that were supplying all of the, the shops and everything that were in this one. Uh, and they had a future date. So the transformer was sized for that. And what happened is later on, they started expanding to the other portion of the shopping center and they took that transformer and they changed it. They increased it in size and maybe the impedance was different. That totally changes the potential available fault current at the existing application for that retail center. So when a modification like that takes place, somebody, and this is gonna be the responsibility of the retail shop management team or whatever is to realize, you know what, has this available fault current calculation changed, right? So again, somebody's gotta be aware of this because again, you could turn around and have now an available fault current that exceeds the existing equipment. And again, I'm not saying that the existing electrician has to know this, but somebody has to step in and take care of this. And again, usually that may be the actual management people of that retail center, or maybe it's the local jurisdiction who says, look, um, we know that this part of the retail center for this transformer was done, but now you're increasing it and to supply another portion of the shopping center. What does that do to the existing equipment that's being supplied by the transformer that's just been replaced? Again, somebody has to do it, but I'm just here to teach you the code, okay? I'm not here to tell you, you're the electrician, you have to worry about that at a later date. Once you did it, you did your job, you left. I'm just saying, this is how the code is written. So it says, when modifications of the electrical installation occur that affect the available fault current at the service, the available fault current shall be verified and recalculated as necessary to ensure the service equipment ratings are sufficient for the available fault current at the line terminals of the equipment, okay? So again, there is an exception to this rule that says the field marking requirements in 110.24a and b shall not be required in industrial installations where conditions of maintenance and supervision ensure that only qualified persons service the equipment. And the reason for that is the probably the assumption is that they have an ongoing maintenance and they're very aware of their equipment and making sure that if they change something that they're gonna change the equipment to accommodate the available fault current. So again, they it's under their supervision and under their maintenance and they have their own protocols to follow.
okay? And that means it's probably going to be serviced by that service team or that maintenance just in that industrial establishment. You with me? Okay. So that's where we're at. So again, modifications, got to make sure everything is still adequate. But for new installations, make sure that you know what that available fault current is and you want to reach out to the utility at that point and get that data. All right, let's get back to the lesson a little bit. And we're probably going to see that again uh, as well as we move down the numbers. All right, we're looking at B now. And of course, B is down here. It's pointing this SCCR rating. It says... The overcurrent protected devices, the total impedance, because this is an AC system here, it says the equipment short circuit current rating of the equipment and other characteristics of the circuit to be protected shall be selected and coordinated to permit the circuit protected devices used to clear the fault, uh, that is used to clear the fault, to do so without extensive damage to the electrical equipment of the circuit. So this is a reason why you want to make sure that if the available fault current is, let's just say, 18,000, okay, then amps, then what you want to do is make sure that your equipment is equal to or greater than that available fault current. So it is designed to withstand that level of fault current without doing extensive damage to the equipment, okay? And it says, this fault shall be assumed to be between either two or more of the circuit conductors phase to phase faulting or between any of the circuit conductors and an equipment grounding conductor, okay? Like a ground fault, right? So listed equipment ap applied in accordance with their listing means you install it, it's listed for the application, shall be considered to meet the requirements of this section and it's 110.10, that is your SCCR rating. So that equipment is going to have labels in there that's going to say what its SCCR rating is. And your overcurrent device, your breaker, is going to also have a rating in there as well to tell you what its AIC rating is. And again, you want all of these to be equal to or greater, preferably greater, than the available fault current that is given to you by the utility up to the line side of this service equipment. So the next is C, and C is just pointing out this warning arc flash hazard and it's saying the warning arc flash label needs to meet the requirements of 110.16a so again uh you see this one here it's got the big warning and it says arc flash hazard on it and it's stamped right on there this could be provided by the manufacturer and if it's not you will supply it again durability for the environment to where it's placed and then d says equipment intended to interrupt current at fault levels shall have an interruptive rating Okay. at nominal circuit voltage at least equal to the available fault current at the line terminals of the equipment, okay? Equipment intended to interrupt current at other than fault current levels shall have an interruptive rating at nominal circuit voltage at least equal to the current that must be interrupted. This is all given to you in 110.9. Now, we haven't looked at these, so we're going to go look at 110.9, in 110.10 just for clarity. So let me get to the code and we'll get to 110.9 first. And here's where it talks about the interruptive rating. It says equipment intended to interrupt current at fault levels shall have an interruptive rating at nominal circuit voltage, at least equal to the available fault current at the line terminals of the equipment, okay? And again, fuses or circuit breakers, uh, do not have an adequate interruptive rating, could, if they don't have an adequate interrupting rating, could rupture while attempting to clear the short circuit. So we need to make sure fuses, circuit breakers have that AIC rating, ampere rating of interruptive current, needs to make sure that it is equal to or greater than the available fault current. So that's 110.9, make sure that's in place. And here's 110.10, it's talking about the circuit's impedance, the short circuit current rating, and other characteristics. So it says the overcurrent protected device, the total impedance, this one looks familiar, this is right out of our lesson. It says the equipment, short circuit current rating, and other characteristics of the circuit to be protected shall be selected and coordinated to permit the circuit protected device used to clear a fault to do so without what? Extensive damage to the electrical equipment of the circuit. How do you do this? You make sure that the SCCR rating and the AIC ratings of the overcurrent protected device, all of those are what? 
equal to or greater than whatever the available fault current is that's given to you by your utility. Make sense? Okay, let's go back to the lesson. All right, E says the available fault current markings addressed in 110.24 is related to the required short circuit current rating of the equipment. Again, the informational notes will remind you about NFPA 70E and the exposure and safe work practices, that type of thing, right? Uh, and then, of course, the available fault current markings addressed in 110.24 is related to the required short circuit current rating and the interruptive rating of the equipment. We just kind of looked at all that there. So if you look at the il illustration here, everything is on here. If this is a service disconnect, it's marked as a service disconnect. It's available fault current is 18.7. Um, so this is 18,700 amps. It looks like it was done on March 26, 2014. And the equipment and all everything inside is rated at least 22 KA or 22,000 amps. So that does exceed 18.7. So this is considered adequate. So it, it meets and exceeds the SCCR rating, the AIC rating, the interruptive rating, all of that with this piece of equipment. So again, the warning labels are installed. Everything looks compliant here, dealing with that, okay? So let me kind of bring you back to me real quick and uh, get this wrapped up. So this is why when we're doing a service, and again, we're not talking about residential, though people ask about residential. In most residential applications, um, the utility limits it to about 10,000 amps when it comes to that available fault current. Again, not a guarantee, but that's typically in my experience that they try to limit it to 10 uh, based on their transformers and how they're located and the service drops and laterals and all that type of stuff. But again, it's still, even though the rule we just lacked, looked at is talking about other than dwellings, it's still important to make sure that your panels, SCCR rating, your main breakers, AIC rating, all of that is equal to or greater than the available fault current. If the utility tells you that they're, they're not going to exceed 10,000 for a residential application, but your panel's rated 22, then you're fine. Okay. But again, it's kind of one of those things as an electrician, uh, it doesn't hurt you to ask and to make sure, because again, at the end of the day, if the available fault current exceeds the rating of the equipment, then you could have a catastrophic event take place when it's trying to clear a phase-to-phase -phase fault or a ground fault, okay? All right, hopefully you got something out of today's lesson. Just talked briefly about available fault currents. You obviously will learn more in our Fast Tracks program about these topics, uh, but if you're interested in it, down in the description, we'll give you uh, information to our Fast Tracks program. It's not just for exam prep. Our Black and our Plus program, for example, is a overview of the National Electrical Code. So it's great for people who just want to get a better understanding of the National Electrical Code, whether you're a DIYer, or whether or not you're an engineer, a designer, um, maybe somebody's in an apprenticeship program and you just want to get better at the National Electrical Code. We have courses for you. If you're already licensed and you want to do a deep dive into commercial or residential or even grounding and bonding or even industrial, we've got courses for that too. So check out our website, fasttracksystem.com. Till next time, folks. Take care. God bless.